Hey everyone, it's Saoirse, and today I'm going to talk about another book that I'm playing catch up with. I read over a month ago now, and that is Tiny Beautiful Things by Cheryl Strayed. This is Advice on Love and Life from Dear Sugar. So Cheryl Strayed, you might know from writing Wild, she has this column called Dear Sugar where she gives advice, and I absolutely loved this book. I've had it on my shelf for a while, it was my mom's, and hadn't gotten to it yet. Um, but then I know I, I talked about a couple videos ago that I was, um, that my mom and I had booked spots to do this uh, workshop thing in North Carolina with Cheryl Strayed, and due to horrible unforeseen circumstances we were not able to make it. Um, so hopefully I get to go to one another day because she does she does things like that every now and then and um, it would be very inspiring to see her talk because yeah I read Wild a few years ago. I read it actually right when I finished my through hike of the AT and then I reread it this year so I will be talking about that soon but first I wanted to talk about this one. It was published in 2012 and it's um, it's just a collection that she made of uh, some of the letters that she has gotten while writing this advice column. And I will say I cried many times while reading this. I also felt hopeful. She's... I don't know how she does it, but she's so good at giving advice. Like, there are situations in here where I would just not know what to say to someone, or... Like, you know how it's really hard for some people to deal with other people's grief. And she just faces it head on. And she's been through so much herself that um, I think it gives her an ability to speak to these things that a lot of people would back away from. Um, yeah, she's not afraid to dig into the things that hurt us the most. And... She just has a fantastic take on how to cope with so many different things that happen because it just shocks me, you know, like you you go through something terrible and then everybody kind of gives you the same, oh, I can't imagine, or oh, you must be really hurting and um, have you thought about trying this or that? And it's just rarely very useful. So the way that she approaches it is much appreciated. Um, I really love this. So, I'll read you just a few things from here, and I'll just say, um, content warning. There is a lot dealing with death and grief and, um, all that. All that. Always fun on my channel, isn't it? It's so fun. So, um, if you've read Wild, then, then you know the devastating beginning of that book. Like, I can't read it without sobbing by page two. Um, her mother dies, um, and so that's kind of a theme throughout some of the advice that she gives. She uses that experience um, to help other people. So, yes. Um, yeah, just like the way she talks about grief. She says, In the months after my mother died, I thought of this woman an inor inordinate amount, and not only because I was distressed by her suffering, I thought of her because I understood her monumental desire and her groundless faith. I believed that I could crack a code, too, that my own irrevocably changed life could be redeemed if only I could find the right combination of things, that in those objects my mother would be given back to me in some indefinable and figurative way that would make it okay for me to live the rest of my life without her. <clears throat> and so I searched. I love that line about it would make it okay for me to live the rest of my life without her. I think that is something that I think about a lot um, when my brain um, spirals and, and starts thinking about the death of everyone and everything I love. Um, I think about like what what could possibly make it okay for 
for me to keep going without, you know, without what I love. And I have yet to figure out an answer. Um, and that's the thing about grief is it, it makes us very, very short-sighted. We don't want to imagine being happy again after a great loss. It doesn't seem like it's possible to be happy again. So she comes at it in a very practical way and um, just really lays it out for you that it's not going to be easy and you're going to feel horrible a lot of the time and a lot of people won't understand. Um, but we keep going somehow. Okay, this one is, what is this? I sometimes, I say this every video, do not understand my notes and I just wrote these like two days ago. This does not, okay. Yeah, sure. So this is, uh, somebody asked Cheryl Strayed to give a graduation speech for English and creative writing majors at the University of Alabama. And so she wrote, she wrote this whole thing, which is really nice of her. And what in the world did I want to read you? Uh, I hope you will be surprised and knowing at once. I hope you'll always have love. I hope you'll have days of ease and a good sense of humor. I hope one of you really will bake me a pie. Banana cream, please. I hope when people ask what you're going to do with your English and or creative writing degree, you'll say, continue my bookish examination of the contradictions and complexities of human motivation and desire, or maybe just carry it with me as I do everything that matters. And then smile very serenely until they say, oh. Um, that just resonated with me because I have an English degree and a creative writing degree. And all the time people ask me, or used to ask me, maybe they don't anymore because I just shut it down. What are you going to do with that? Or, oh, so you're going to be a teacher? I don't know what I'm going to do, and no, I don't want to be a teacher. I mean, at least right now in my brain, currently, I have no desire to be a teacher. Um, am I ruling it out forever, like, uh, teaching um, at a university? No, I, I wouldn't want to teach a lower level than that. I used to, like, my original degree was in French, with a minor in education to teach high school French. And... Like, from substituting and all that and having been a teenager, teenagers are fun. Like, they have really interesting ways of looking at the world. And, you know, it wasn't so long ago that I was in high school, so I remember what it's like. Um, and you can get into really good debates with them, and, and it's interesting. And to hear the way that they think about literature, the literature that, that you read as an adult, like they're reading it as a teenager, it is really, really interesting. But... I just can't stomach working that early every day, like, that's pretty much the main reason, just going to the same place every day that early, because my high school started at 7 in the morning, and the teachers have to be there even earlier. It's just gross. It's gross. Um, and actually has been proven to be detrimental to um, teenagers learning, because they're not supposed to be up that early. <laughs> They're supposed to get more sleep, so it's messed up, but yeah, um, wouldn't rule out teaching as a professor, but I don't really want to. So when people ask me that question, it makes me feel like I am doing something wrong because I don't know why I got an English degree other than I love literature. I don't really know what to say to those people. So I like her response. this little stool next to me because the, the cats love it and so now 
Maybe they'll sit next to me while I do videos. I still really miss my old setup where I had the desk in front of a window and the cats would just walk across. If you watch my old videos, it is just constant cat crossing. And I don't really have a good place where I can do that in this house. It's which is so stupid because there's so much room and I'm like constantly renovating. I just painted this wall, by the way, and like have I've redone a lot in this living room in the past few weeks. But there isn't like a place where I can have a desk in front of me where there's a window because that was the reason they were always walking in front of me. They also just wanted to sit with me, but they liked looking out the window. So it would look like they were looking at the camera. They would just be staring, but it wasn't the camera. They were looking right past it out the window. But now I have a catio for them. So they pretty much go and sit outside like all day. Um, they're like, we don't really need windows as much anymore because now we can just sit out in our catio. Anyway, at least she's sitting right here with me. Um, what is this? Okay, so what do we miss out on? This idea of, and everybody gets this, fear of missing out, and I've talked about it before with the the Sylvia Plath classic line in, um, in the bell jar about sitting under the fig tree and being unable to choose any of the figs, so just watching them all rot at your feet. The, I feel like that all the time. I feel like so many of us have really limitless potential to do so many things and we just can't pick because once you pick it feels like everything else is gone so it's like I'd rather live this sort of nothing life than choose anything. Anyway, she says, I'll never know and neither will you of the life you don't choose. We'll only know that whatever that sister life was, it was important and beautiful and not ours. It was the ghost ship that didn't carry us. There's nothing to do but salute it from the shore. I love the way she puts things. Like, she makes me feel like it's alright to have these feelings. And, yeah, big, difficult things happen. And this is the way we can cope with it. And she's not so much... Like, I really, really don't like those people who are really hard asses about it. And, you know, the whole pull yourself up by your bootstraps crap. I don't like when people are tough with me. <laughs> I never responded to that kind of coaching when I was in sports. It was just, it just made me cry. So I need people who are, are much, like, softer with me. But I like the way that she's, she's soft with the people she's talking to. But she's also firm, um, but not hard. Does that make sense? It's like a mattress. Like, you, you want it to be firm enough so you don't have a horrible spine, but you don't want it to be so hard that it just hurts to lie on it. Anyway. Something about books. Oh yeah. So this person... Yeah, this person is a writer who's writing to her and is dealing with a lot of the, the feelings that I think many writers deal with, at least I do. Jealousy and feeling inadequate and just kind of given up. Um, so she says, the marketplace decides, sorry, the other thing is the marketplace decides to do what? Okay, the marketplace decides what to do with your creation. Uh, a writer gets a book deal when he or she has written a book that A, an editor loves, and B, a publisher believes readers will purchase. The number of copies a publisher believes people will purchase varies widely. It could be 10 million or 712. This number has pretty much nothing to do with the quality of the book, but rather is dictated by literary style, subject matter, and genre. And this number has everything to do with the amount of your book deal, which is also related to the resources available to the publishing house that wants to publish your book. The big presses can give authors six-figure advances for books they believe will sell in significant numbers. The small ones cannot. Again, this has no relationship whatsoever to the quality of the books they publish. Um, and she's saying, I mentioned this because I think you've conflated the book with the book deal. These are two separate things. You're in charge of the book. And so on and so forth. Uh, and that's important to remember. And this is something that I think you can apply to, to a lot of ventures in life. Um, I specifically think of all the auditions that I've done um, in the entertainment world and how a lot of them went horribly, horribly bad and just so embarrassing. Um, 
I will never forget a specific audition. Like once I was already working for Disney, there's a lot of internal auditions, and I did one that was just so shocking, so shocking. Just imagine completely forgetting all the choreography that somebody just taught you, and you're being filmed for getting it. So there's those situations where you actually kind of suck and like you wouldn't be the best for, person for the job, but there's other situations where you've, you've written something good or you've done a good audition, but that just isn't what they're looking for at that time. They had, you know, a bagel for breakfast instead of a croissant and so they're feeling a little different today and so just something isn't quite right about what you're offering and it doesn't mean that it's bad. Um, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, I'm not sure if I'm even sticking to the original point of this. Um, but yeah, she's saying, like, you could have a quality book and and you might be with a, an independent publisher and so they just can't give you as much money. It doesn't mean it's not a book that's worth millions. Anyway, I think that's important to remember for anybody who, like, bases their self-worth on approval from others, um, especially when it comes to jobs. Because it is so easy, like, in the arts, I think especially, because there's no right or wrong. It's not like you pass an exam and become this, like, you're qualified to do this and, and it's indisputable. It's not like that at all. It's, it's based on a feeling and does a casting director or does an, uh, an agent or an editor or publisher get the right vibe from what you're giving? Um, and that's why it's so hard to judge your own work, because it's subjective. Anyway. This one's super depressing. Uh, so she deals a lot with death. And here a lot of people are writing her dealing with, with grief after death. And somebody lost... Let's see. This person lost their... Their son, yeah. A drunk driver killed their son, and he was only 22. And so she responds, and this is one of the things she says. When my son was six, he said, we don't know how many years we have for our lives. People die at all ages. He said it without anguish or remorse, without fear or desire. It has been healing to me to accept in a very simple way that my mother's life was 45 years long, that there was nothing beyond that. There was only my expectation that there would be. My mother at 89, my mother at 63, my mother at 46. Those things don't exist. They never did. And then she says, think my son's life was 22 years long. Breathe in. Think my son's life was 22 years long. Breathe out. There is no 23. And I'm going to cry thinking about it. It's just... It's one way to look at it that might help you, might not. Because I think we always believe that there's something that we could have done differently. Um, especially if it's art, if it's animals, if it's our children. We think that we could save them somehow if we just did something different. Um, if we had, you know, somewhere along the line, like we messed up. Maybe if we'd done that one thing differently, we wouldn't be in this situation. Um, and nothing is really that simple. It's it's so tempting to just go and blame ourselves and make it all sound really simple. It's just all my fault. But life is a lot more complicated than that. And to look at it that way that it really is out of our control and this life was only ever going to be that long because that's just how it is and we can picture the life lasting so much longer, but us picturing it, it doesn't mean that that was ever going to be or that, or that it will be. Um, it just feels really, really unfair. And when any life is cut short, of course it feels like we were cheated and they were cheated and it's really hard to cope with. But I, I like what she tells this person. Okay, this scene is really, whew, this one's hard. Mm -mm 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 -mm. 
Let me just see, what is the last thing I was going to read? I might read like a little bit here. I'll try to get through it. So she's at a garage sale with her mom. Um, this is what happened, what actually happened to Cheryl Strayed. Uh, you want that dress? My mother asked, glancing up at nonchalantly from her own perusals. And this is like a little girl's dress she's looking at. Why would I? I snapped, perturbed with myself more than her. For some day, said my mother. But I'm not even going to have kids, I argued. You can put it in a box, she replied. Then you'll have it, no matter what you do. I don't have a dollar, I said with finality. I do, my mother said and reached for the dress. I put it in a box in a cedar chest that belonged to my mother. I dragged it with me all the way along the scorching trail of my twenties and into my thirties. I had a son and then a daughter. The red dress was a secret only known by me, buried for years among my mother's best things. When I finally unearthed it and held it again, it was like being slapped and kissed at the same time, like the volume was being turned way up and also way down. The two things that were true about its existence had an opposite effect and were yet the same single fact. My mother bought a dress for the granddaughter she'll never know. My mother bought a dress for the granddaughter she'll never know. How beautiful, how ugly, how little, how big, how painful, how sweet. It's almost never until later that we can draw a line between this and that. There was no force at work other than my own desire that compelled me to want that dress. Its meaning was made only by my mother's death and my daughter's birth, and then it meant a lot. The red dress was the material evidence of my loss, but also of the way my mother's love had carried me forth beyond her, her life extending years into my own in ways I never could have imagined. It was a becoming that I would not have dreamed was mine, the moment that red dress caught my eye. My daughter doesn't connect me to my mother more than my son does. My mother lives as brightly in my boy child as she does in my girl. But seeing my daughter in that red dress on the second Christmas of her life gave me something beyond words. The feeling I got was like that original double whammy I'd had when I first pulled that dress from the box of my mother's best things. Only now it was, my daughter is wearing a dress that her grandmother bought for her at a yard sale. My daughter is wearing a dress that her grandmother bought for her at a yard sale. It's so simple, it breaks my heart. How unspecial that fact is to so many. How ordinary for a child to wear a dress her grandmother bought her. But how very extraordinary it was to me. I suppose this is what I mean when I say we cannot possibly know what will manifest in our lives. We live and have experiences and leave people we love and get left by them. People we thought would be with us forever aren't and people we didn't know would come into our lives do. Our work here is to keep faith with that, to put it in a box and wait to trust that someday we will know what it means, so that when the ordinary miraculous is revealed to us, we will be there, standing before the baby girl in the pretty dress, grateful for the smallest things. <clears throat> yeah, I was crying a lot when I first read that. And then I'll just read like the last, this is the last page if you don't wanna hear it. I mean, it's not like spoilers, it's not that kind of book, but she is responding to somebody who asked, what would you tell your 20-something self if you could talk to her now? And this is part of it. One hot afternoon during the era in which you've gotten yourself ridiculously tangled up with heroin, you'll be riding the bus and thinking what a worthless piece of crap you are when a little girl will get on the bus holding the strings of two purple balloons. She'll offer you one of the balloons, but you won't take it because you believe you no longer have a right to such tiny, beautiful things. You're wrong. You do. Your assumptions about the lives of others are, in, are indirect are in direct relation to your naive pomposity. Many people you believe to be rich are not rich. Many people you think have it easy worked hard for what they got. Many people who seem to be gliding right along have suffered and are suffering. Many people who appear to you to be old and stupidly settled down with kids and cars and houses were once every bit as hip and pompous as you. When you meet a man in the doorway of a Mexican restaurant who later kisses you while explaining that this kiss doesn't mean anything because much as he likes you, he's not interested in having a relationship with you or anyone right now, just laugh and kiss him back. Your daughter will have his sense of humor. Your son will have his eyes. The useless days will add up to something. The shitty waitressing jobs, the hours writing in your journal, the long meandering walks, the hours reading poetry and story collections and novels and dead people's diaries, and wondering about sex and God and whether you should shave your underarms or not. <laughs> These things are your becoming. One Christmas at the very beginning of your 20s when your mother gives you a warm coat that she saved for months to buy, don't look at her skeptically after she tells you she thought the coat was perfect for you. Don't hold it up and say it's longer than you like your coats to be and too puffy and possibly even too warm. Your mother will be dead by spring. The coat will be the last gift she gave you. You will regret the small thing you didn't say for the rest of your life.